uh, the Mumford Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors. Um, uh, let's take a roll. Uh, Emma? Here. Brian? Here. Jill? Here. Um, Mara? Here. Adrian? Here. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was like, that's, that no, wasn't right. Yeah, like, you just happened to be, um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was in robot mode. Um, Bridget? Here. Etiquette? Here. Andrew? Here. And Jerry's not here yet, so, okay. Um, so before I'm going to public comment, I just want to note that this is um, Bridget's last meeting. And again, thank her for all the great work she's done on the board. She has been such a tremendous asset to the district um, over the last, I believe, six, seven years on the board. Um, six years, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and just has poured uh, a ton of, of energy and smarts and, and really hard work into uh, a whole variety of issues that, that really made the, the district um, much better. And, and we, we thank her and we are going to miss her, but um, she is definitely uh, taking a, a well-deserved break from um, the, the mayhem. So we hope Hope you stay very involved as a parent and community member. Um, and uh, again, are super thankful for, for all you've done over the last uh, six plus years. Um, and I believe that, that Libby has a little gift for the board that unfortunately we can't can't give you in in person, but it, it will it will it will get you. And again, just uh, uh, already gotten no, to. Libby, oh, yeah. so on top of it, it already came. Thank you guys very much. Cool. Claire, we can't, I'm sorry we can't have cake. No cake. <laughs> Clarification, Anna is so on top of things. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you again uh, for all you've done. Um, so let's open it up to uh, public comment. And I think, um, you know, tonight we're having uh, a little election of our own, um, although unlike other elections, all the candidates are, are wonderful, uh, and the tough the part will be choosing one. Um, and we'll finish the vote count on the same night. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Um, so why don't we use uh, this time, just in case folks either want to hop off um, and don't have to stay for the whole meeting, uh, if you want to speak about your candidacy, I think we have um, at least three of the four candidates here. Um, and then again, we will we will actually deliberate uh, at the end. But if you, if you just want to take some time during public comment, uh, and I think this time I will will break the rules and allow board members to have any questions. If you if you do have, which usually don't do in public comment, but for the the candidates that will be um we'll allow that and obviously you know bridget since this is open session there i don't have any issue with you um you know being here um yeah but just to be clear i'm not gonna play any role so exactly i'm gonna yeah. i'll yeah, turn you'll, you'll put your community member participant hat on and um and then obviously um you know other other members of of the public can comment on whatever they want as well so Let's start with um, with anyone who is not running for the board and just has a general comment. And I also just want to state uh, several people um, wrote notes of support to various candidates, um, you know, and those have been circulated. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've already weighed in via uh, email, the board has has gotten your your comments. Um, so if anyone uh, would like to speak, um, you know, please go ahead and um, use the raise hand function, which if you hit participants, you'll see a raise hand function. Um, and if, if you can't find that, just feel free to go ahead and um, uh, put yourselves on video and physically raise your hand. So is there anyone who 
wishes to make a comment. Um, so we have Renee Hansel. Okay. Um, Renee? Hi. Um, good night to everyone. Um, I wanted to make a public comment. Uh, one, thank you all for all the work that you do. And um, two, I just wanted to talk about the new measure for COVID that we're having on the schools where kids are taking their breakfast home and uh, having work as a social worker. I know that kids with food insecurity, you know, foster kids, kids that live in an abusive household are probably not getting that meal for breakfast. And, um, you know, this measure is, I, in my opinion, it's just feeding more anxiety and fear into the kids and just encouraging other kids to go to school. Um, at this point, I don't think that we're providing any of the kids with any tools to learn how to deal with this fear, anxiety, inadequacy that is going on. Um, and in a way, it feels to them that more is taken away from them. Um, I think we're forgetting to um, tell kids to live their lives with passion, and we're just feeding them more fear that is all around us. Um, for example, I know from my own son, he can't go along without having a meal. And fortunately, we don't suffer any of the food insecurity, but it's hard for him. I know from other kids that their first meal of the day is at school, either because they can eat in the morning early because it makes them nauseous. And of course, there's the kids that, you know, have nothing. Also, food is so social that um, that for kids that don't like to eat, this is an opportunity for them to share, you know. So, and besides all this, I think that the goal of the school is to keep the kids with a strong immune system. And they need food, they need it often, they need peace of mind, you know, they need to have more uh, fun and um, feel their value on um, this social interactions and community. Um, you know, my wish is that we could find a, a way to uh, provide for them, you know, uh, a more calm environment, taking into account everything that is going around. And, um, you know, using more words that are not based in fear or scariness, um, but just also handing on some of that responsibility to them, which I think they're dealing really well with it. Um, I want, you know, I want all the kids to go to bed with full bell if we could, but that's not the job of the school, but we can tell them uh, how good they are, to tell them their value, make them feel good about their lives, make them you know, as much as possible, uh, feel good of having friendships in our community. You know, and I want to imagine that we can be more love and less fear. Anyway, that's my comment, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Um, anyone else other than CNE? Um, I'm assuming all the candidates on want to speak. I'm just going to go in order of how they appear on my screen. Uh, Adrian. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Gill. Um, I am just so excited to be here today. It looks like I'm in great company with others that are also have interest in, in the board position. And I'm just here today. You know, I've been a passionate um, lover of our community. I've been in Montpelier for five years. 
And I've been involved with both UES and the Main Street Middle School um, since we came here. And, um, you know, my passion lies within health and wellness. That is my foundational experience. I have a master's in public health and I work with schools around the country and helping guide them in wellness policies and social emotional learning and um, health education and being physically active to, you know, make our students and staff, you know, healthier, especially during these unbelievably stressful times. And so, um, you know, I know that the board here is amazing and, um, I don't know exactly what you're looking for to fill this spot, but I'm sure you will all make the most amazing decision and whoever you choose is gonna be the best um, person for that position. And I will continue to support the schools and continue to uh, support the middle school where both of my daughters are at. And I'm just excited to kind of see the future and how you all grow and you know, hopefully I'll be a part of it. Um, but I just, I'm really glad to be a part of this community and appreciate everything that you all do every day to support our students, our staff, and our community. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. Um, any questions for Adrian? Great, thanks. Uh, Mia. Thanks, Jim. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mia Moore. I'm a Montpelier resident and mother to three children in our school system. And um, thank you very much for considering my candidacy to, uh, to fill the seat that uh, Bridget is vacating. Um, she's definitely leaving some big shoes to fill. Uh, and I also want to express appreciation for the other folks who have stepped forward to and, and volunteering to, to serve in this way as well. Um, you all know uh, how challenging and rewarding uh, it can be. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about my experience uh, just to round out what I shared with all of you in my letter of interest. Um, so I was the chief of staff at Democracy for America, which is a national political action committee uh, for 10 years. And my primary roles there were organizational budgeting and long-term planning and ensuring our people were supported and accountable to their goals. Um, about halfway through my tenure in this role, we learned some very hard truths about what it was like to be a person of color working at DFA. And at the time, this was pretty shocking to me because as a white person with the position of power um, in the organization, I wasn't experiencing working there in the same way. And it was also pretty terrible for me, be, for everyone in the organization, but I felt it very personally because I had the power to do something about it and I hadn't up until then. Um, so we got to work um, first by educating ourselves as a team of staff and then by working on changes. And it was really hard uh, and we didn't get it right a lot of the time, but we stuck with it together. And I wanted to share that with you all because as a district and as a community, I see us all really coming together to do very similar work. And I understand what it means to slowly learn the painful realities of oppression um, because I don't experience them, them um, myself in many ways, uh, to mess up along the way and to begin to envision a more equitable and just system. Um, and I've worked on teams trying to unravel white supremacy habits and culture from our own policies, our own practices, and our own behaviors. And I know that this work can't be a separate and unique effort, um, but that instead it needs to be woven and integrated into all the decisions that we make. And I hope that those experiences that I've had um, can be an asset to the work that the district and, and our school communities are currently undergoing. So thank you again for your consideration uh, of my candidacy. Great, thank you, Mia. Um, questions for Mia? Excellent, and uh, Chloe Wexler. Hello, hi, um, here I am. <laughs> my name is, hello, good evening. My name is Chloe Wexler. I um, have also been living in the Montpelier community for um, about four years now. Um, and now that I'm a little bit more settled, I've been thinking about ways that I can, I too can get involved and give back to the community. Um, due to my, you know, especially right now with everything that's going on, um, I, 
was thinking that the way that I could conceivably most um, efficiently and readily, you know, uh, uh, become a sort of participating member of the community is through my through potential involvement with the school board. Um, and this is because of my current job. Um, I am the a legislative fiscal data analyst for the Joint Fiscal Office, and my primary charge is to um, calculate the yields. So I have a unique familiar, familiarity with uh, the education fund. Um, and so I think that I could, um, I could at least on the fiscal side and the budgetary side, I could um, rapidly become a participating member of the board, um, especially since I know that you guys are in your budget process right now, as I too am in my budget process to prepare the December one letter. Um, so on that, so that's sort of one part of the equation. Um, and then I am not 100% familiar what's going on with the district. I actually do not have a student in the district. I um, I come to the board, you know, without, I don't have any policy incentives or, you know, preconceived notions. I would just come as someone who would listen and make informed decisions based on the information that I receive. Um, I did go to Harwood. Um, I remember playing soccer <laughs> at Montpelier High School when I was a kid. Um, and I, you know, I want to make sure that, <clears throat> you know, the students in Vermont continue to have as, as good of an experience as I had. I actually had a great experience going through the public schools. So those are my little pitches. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, We'll see what happens, and um, maybe you'll see me around more frequently as I, you know, maybe not through this particular position, but start to get more involved in, in the Montpelier schools. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chloe. And I also want to point out that um, Josh Kirtland also uh, applied. He was not sure he was going to be able to make it tonight, um, given, I think, our obligation. Um, but if he does pop in and it's convenient, we may uh, allow him and give him time to speak as well later. Um, Jim, any questions for Chloe? Jim, just for in, for all of the candidates, um, can we please clarify this this position will be up for re-election in March, correct? Yes. As will we'll have more than our usual number that are up for re-election in March, correct? Because Emma came in to Steve's seat, which he left after the election, if my memory serves correct. Is that right? Yeah. So what we'll have in March is uh, this this seat will uh, will ex actually expires in March. Um, so how it works is the appointment, the appointment is good till the next election. And then um, in, in the case of Emma's seat, uh, I think it's two years. It would be two years because she because Steve left shortly after he won a three year term. Um, Emma could choose to run for those two years. She could choose to say, oh my God, what did I get into? I'm not gonna do this anymore. Uh, or she could choose to run for the open three-year term. Um, and uh, Bridget's term expires in March. So uh, who's ever appointed to this could either, um, if, if they were interested in continuing, could either run for another three-year term uh, could run for the two-year term, the rest of Steve's, um, or I'm not sure if we have another seat up or not in Montpelier. Um, do we? My seat should also be up. Yeah. Oh, that's right, because you were appointed. Yeah, one, well. one year. Yeah. Was, and so Mara, I think, would be, so we'll have like a one-year term. So I think we'll have a, a one-year, a two-year, and a three-year term. Two, at... two, three years, and one two-year. Okay. Yeah. I just want to clarify this because we have so many extraordinary candidates and we can only choose one candidate. 
but there is going to be an election with a more than usual number of seats on the board coming up in March. And also to let the public know. Yeah. About that. Ryan, yeah, exactly. Is your, as well? Are you, is your seat up on March? Yes, my term will be ending in March. So there will be an election in Roxbury as well this cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see Libby, Libby gritting her teeth. <laughs> um, so following up on that, so yes, so the the appointment will be will be till March. Um, I incur one. I want to thank everyone who stepped forward. Uh, this is a super impressive slate of of applicants. It's going to be a really tough choice. I, I wish we could appoint you all, um, but but you know, please do keep your eye on March if we don't choose you because that is a great opportunity. Um, to either run again, uh, as, you know, um, and obviously that's that's an election, so the the voters will decide then, um, and you know, obviously next March, and you know, just we do have vacancies that pop up just due to um, you know people people stepping down midterm. So um, so I want to thank all of you. It's, it's it's just really wonderful to see uh, so many talented people step up and. Um, you, you will you will all be on our list for future um, future vacancies and or elections um, because we uh, yeah we'd love to get all of you uh, on the board at, at some time. Um, all right, um, that concludes public comment. Um, uh, let's move to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So I, had, I had a question. Oh, I yeah. don't think we saw the policy monitoring report, or I didn't see the policy monitoring report for the um, AO3. It's a board member expectations, right, Emma? Yeah. Yeah. Is that in the in the? Um, mm -hmm. Are we voting on that right now, or no? No, that is later. That's policy okay. monitoring at the end. Um, okay, sorry about that. And I have it here. I can send it along to you, Emma. We're we're just we're just voting on minutes from recent committee meetings. The last school board meeting warrants for payroll and accounts payable through November thirteenth, and then the superintendent's report. Yeah. No, and I. I think it was the okay. um, any uh, well first do I have a, a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? Great. Uh, let's go to a vote. Vote, Emma. Aye. Jill. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Mara. Aye. Annika. Aye. Andrew. Aye. And Bridget. Aye. Uh, consent agenda is approved. Um, We already covered board member applications. Um, so board discussion is uh, budget goals and priorities. And Libby, I want to hand it up to you on that. Yeah, I just have really broad slides. And Grant was going to try to join us, but he was rushing home after the uh, meeting before this. So he may not have gotten home. But um, I Do just we... have. Hey, Libby, do we want to do the policy readings first to give them some time? Yeah, if we don't mind. I mean, if it's not a big deal, let's do that first and then just see if he has time to, if he gets home to jump on. Sometimes his internet's not so great at home too, so, but that might give him a minute. Okay. Um, let's, let's rearrange that. I don't know if he's going to buy us a ton of time or not, but we can, we can try. Um, so we're going to skip to the policy reading. Uh, so we have a second reading 
of the electronic communication between employees and students policy and the C-12 prevention of sexual ha harassment as prohibited by Title IX. Um, any comments or edits uh, on these two policies? No, but I just want to say your plan paid off. Yes, I, I saw I, I saw Grant appear. <laughs> I think we actually can't edit the policies, these particular yeah. ones. So. Yeah, they're mandated ones, right? Yeah. So makes makes the discussion a little shorter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let's just, while we're on it, uh, do the policy monitoring as well. Um, we have to approve these. Um, do I have a motion to approve the Dwadi? Any questions about the policy monitoring reports for um, Libby? I agree with Emma that I cannot find the report for AO3. I can I can find the text of AO3, just not. Yeah, that's I was looking through and that's what I found too. That was the one that you were doing, Jim. Huh? Yeah. You were gonna do that one. I was? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that one wasn't. Yeah. I was trying to think of a, of a good way to say that, but I didn't have to think of any other good way. <laughs> no, you can call me out on it. I'm sorry. It's been, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Um, well, let's kick that one to next time. Yeah, we can just move it to the next time. Okay. Uh, Jim, would you like any input from board members on? I would love input from board people, members. I don't know. Yes. I don't actually have any, but I just thought I'd throw out that idea since we're all here looking at the policy. <laughs> I mean, I will say I, I think that the board's done a great job of of uh, board members of taking on the work of the board, which is part of this policy. Um, I think that that's been very well met in the past year. Any other questions or comments? And I will I will actually do this next time. I would echo Bridget just in the sense of um, the board has done an exceptional job through some very challenging times where the where it would have been very easy to come out of their lane. So okay. I will uh, I will write up something and circulate it next um, on the seventeenth. So I apologize for that. Um, and then um, any questions about the FO3 transportation? No? Um, do I have a motion to approve and we'll just do the FO3 transportation report? So moved. Um, do I have a second? A second. Um, any discussion? Yeah, Emma? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mara? Aye. Annika? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Great, approved. And now, um, now that we have both Olivia and Grant here, let's go to the um, budget goals and priorities. Yeah, so we just put together a um, very slim, I don't think we've actually ever done this for budget time um, before, um, but this is just a very slim, a uh, piece of where the administration is right now. We've had several meetings. We've actually slowed down the budget process and had more face-to-face, -face, um, well, sometimes virtually, uh, time with the administrative team because we have so many new members on our administrative team um, and because it's just such an oddball year. Uh, so we've had a lot of conversation as, amongst ourselves and we're starting to zero in on where we believe the priorities need to be based on what we're seeing in the in our fields. Um, but this is uh, and also a chance of the board members to weigh in. So I have just four very short slides 
um, for some themes we're thinking about and some questions for the board for you all to have a discussion around, okay? Um, but Grant is here as well, just in, just in case there's more money questions that he would be a better, better suited than me to answer. Um, so just a reminder, I know most of you have seen this before, but we always want to put this in front of the community and we always want to put it in front of the board mem members. This is the MRPS theory of growth that all kids will learn at high levels because of what we do every single day. And if we have collective responsibility and collaborative practices, formalized essential learning, a timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, and high quality instruction in every classroom, then we'll reach that goal of all kids learning at high levels. Um, for right now, what we're looking at for this budget cycle to support is high quality instruction in every classroom, which actually isn't a whole financial piece to it that's much different than other years, but this has certainly been, this was actually where we were gonna focus all of our efforts this year, um, but because we're in this strange place where we can't really get into classrooms and teaching looks different and classrooms look different, um, we're still focusing on high quality instruction, but nowhere near in the way that we were focusing on it. Actually, this year we're really we're really doubling down on collaborative practices and collective responsibilities because of the situation we're in right now, which is not a bad thing. It's not holding us back. It's just making us stronger in that that particular circle. Um, but what you will see a theme around is timely system to inter inter enrich, intervene, and remediate. And the idea is that the administrative administrative team will most likely put forward for actual dollars um, that we're looking at. Um, we also want to put in front of you some enrollment trends that are pretty significant. So since the 1920 school year, the high school has increased by 55 students um, and it's modeling to significantly continue that increase. Uh, so we have a lot more kids coming into our high school and that really influences the mandatory courses, particularly at the ninth and 10th grade. Once kids get to 11th and 12th grade, they can start taking a lot of different things and there's different offerings outside of our high school walls. Um, but it that, minute, that influx of kids, we have a significantly larger 10th grade, for instance. Um, it really influences some things that kids have to take, mandatory things kids have to take. Oh, Jim, I see Josh is entering the board meeting too. Oh, no, okay. Um, and then Main Street Middle School is still increasing since the 1920 school year. They've increased by 20 students. That's continually, that will continue to increase, except not as significantly as the high school. Um, right now, our seven, we are top heavy at 7-8. Um, so our 7-8 classes are, are very big um, at, the, at Main Street Middle School. Our sixth grade is just a slight bit smaller, but not much. Um, so it's we have we have a few more years at Main Street busting at the seams for enrollment uh, that the board has talked about before. UAS is remaining constant, um, but it is going to start to decline starting next year. That's what the modeling is predicting. But uh, again, <clears throat> the modeling at UES is a little bit tricky um, because because kindergarten is not mandatory. Um, and so there were some people who chose not to engage in kindergarten this year because they didn't have to. Um, so those numbers may not be our a current reality of the actual five-year-olds in our community, but we don't know that. Um, there's no real way to know that. We are, it's also based on like birth rates. So our kindergarten numbers are based on birth rates and, and that's not exactly a reliable number. However, it's what the model is built on for our kindergarten. So it is going to start to decline in terms of enrollment, but um, but again, that modeling may be a little off. And then RBS is just hard to model because it's so small. And if um, you know one family moves in with three kids, that significantly <laughs> changes the population at RBS. So it's just really hard to model it. But what we can say across time that it's pretty much remained constant um, across, across time. So um, across what we have anyway, the information we have. So that's what Grant's kind of modeling for going forward. But the enrollment trends are significant and they will they do influence our budgetary thinking. Oops. Oops, sorry. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about is opportunities for this year's budget. 
Our administrative team um, would really like to build our capacity for intensive needs in special education. Um, our current reality that is that less than 0.01 students at UES and MSMS cost the district $291,814,000 because of outside placements or outside consultants. So what the team would really like to try to do is to build our capacity internally. Um, so we, which may be a dollar amount up front, but eventually decrease this reliance on outside consultancy. Um, right now we have a BCBA that we hired last year and that will allow us to build a lot of S, uh, social emotional learning capacity in house. Um, and it has to, it's all tied up in negotiations and all kinds of things like that as well. But we have plans to build that capacity and the BCBA lets us go a long way in that. We, but we also are looking at our kids who have intensive special needs and how we're servicing them and if we're doing best, the best by them. Um, and do we really have a program built for kids in a way that is going that continues to build and, and increase their learning capacity so that they are learning to their highest levels as well? And we're not sure that we have a definitive on that, but we think that we, we're building a plan or a program that we're going to present to the board um, around increasing our human resource capacity and in, in intensive needs. Debbie, uh, so I'm on. just, oh, go ahead, Andrew, sorry. Um, I'm just not, I'm not entirely certain what that means. Less than 0.01 students cost 291,814. Does that mean that they're, so I, that should be a percentage, actually. Sorry. Oh, okay. Zero <laughs> one percent of students. Sorry, I'm just missing that. Okay. Slide. Sorry about that, Andrew. Good question. So, so a very what what it means is a very few number of students with high needs cost the district a lot of money in this area. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just um, for people listening, the um, A two in-house board certified behavior analyst. Oh, thank you, Anne. <laughs> thank you, Emma. <laughs> emotional learning capacity building. Thank you for clarifying jargon. I owe a dime to the jargon drawer. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, that's a board certified behavior analyst, um, which is odd for schools to have. Not many schools have them. Uh, so it's usually the outside consultancies who have them. So we want to try to keep that position um, in, our, in our ranks. So the next thing we're looking at is. I was going to just ask another. Um, I mean, are we sure that that we can? I mean, aren't there some other factors that influence outside placements, like um, desires of parents, et cetera, that can be expensive it's and and hard to resolve on a and sometimes on a case by case basis, we can have something explode regardless of what our. In -house That's capacity on a case is. By case. Yeah, absolutely on a case by case basis. It's not the case right now. So outside consultancy and placements is an IEP team decision, which of course is a school team and a parent team working collaboratively. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are cases and have been cases um, where we did the IEP team disagrees on what those services would be. Um, and that's been a little costly to the district currently. Um, this number does not reflect that necessarily. Yeah. Um, so unforeseen retirements allows for potential new programming, particularly at Main Street Middle School in the high school. So we did have some retirements that the board offered the early retirement incentive this year because of the situation we're in. We didn't expect for those retirements, but they've allowed us to have a year of thinking about what we could do um, for other programming that has, you know, traditional programming that's happened in the past and how do we reimagine it for, for going forward in the future. Um, one example of that is Crafter's Edge at the middle school and how could we use the capacity that we have there to build um, potentially a program that can build across the four years at the at the middle school so that the eighth graders do have a grand experience, much like Crafter's Edge, um, but that might be uh, more reflective of the district's values around sustainability and that kind of thing. So we're kind of looking at that right now and Katie's gonna start um, a conversation with the community after the winter hall, the winter break um, around this piece as well. But there, there's some potential new programming that may or may not influence the budget, um, but it's definitely things we're talking about right now. And then more kids at the, at the middle school and the high school, 
that just increases the need for humans <laughs> for uh, required coursework, but it also equals different opportunities for kids. So if we need, uh, last year the board added uh, some fine arts work at the, at, the, or at the high school, but there is a potential that we need even more opportunities for kids there because it's a requirement and we, we currently don't have a whole lot of, of, of offerings there. We looked at that last year and maybe that we're proposing something new this year. Um, so the increase in human resources isn't just because we have more kids, but it's also because we want to think about different opportunities for students. And I know that's really broad in general, but we're still really in discussion about bringing to the board what exactly we want to do with that idea. You know, but it's just, I wanted to make sure you knew that 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 enrollment does does impact um, some budgetary decisions going forward. Um, so so last was just some questions that you could use as part of your discussion jump off, um, or you could go other other places too. What are priorities the community would like the administration to consider in building our budget um, to present to the board? Are there areas that the community does not want us to focus on? but then wants more focus, you know, what don't we focus on? What do we focus on? Um, and where are the landmines that we're, we want to make sure that we don't, don't touch um, going forward. So, so I'll leave it to you all to um, discuss, ask Grant and I any questions. We can take it back to the administrative team as we're thinking forward. Um, we're, we've got a really good start on this budget, so, but we want to make sure that we have this input before we move forward even more. Great, thanks, Libby. Um, I guess two things, questions for Libby, and then um, uh, also comments on, on her questions, and we can obviously, um, you know, keep giving that feedback as the next few meetings move forward uh, and we hear more from the community, but uh, Jill? Thanks. I just, real quick, I think it's helpful for me as a new board member going into this and maybe some folks that are listening. So the budget we're starting to have the conversation is about is the one that eventually will become something that we're all voting on in March, right? That's the time frame because it's so, it's so hard to look past COVID right now, but I just, I just thought that would be important to confirm that understanding. So, okay. Yes. And it's for the fiscal year 22 budget. So we're talking about July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Yeah. Yeah. And just for what we usually kind of do from a time frame perspective is we'll get the first budget presentation. Um, the first meeting of December. All the the first meeting. Will be there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll give input. Um, and you know, based on that input and then based on some other things that happen. And it's kind of this rolling process where, you know, Grant, Grant is making guesstimates about what, you know, the CLA is going to be, what the yield is going to be, what our equalized pupil numbers are going to be. And, you know, we'll kind of get that information in real time as we try to, you know, also, um, you know, bring in any, you know, input or, uh, you know, other factors from the board or through the board, the community. Um, and then there'll be a second presentation, usually a, a presentation to the community um, sometime in January that we try to do as an open meeting. We'll obviously probably do that through Zoom this year. Um, and then uh, we have to vote on it and finalize it by when January 19th or something. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, then, then we hand it off and, uh, you know, both uh, the city of Montpelier and the town of Roxbury, you know, approve it in March. So, um, and then, you know, obviously adjustments are, are made to the taxes depending on what the legislature ultimately, ultimately does. Um, so we, we, yeah, even when it's approved, we don't have final numbers for the tax impacts are going to be, but we have a, a pretty good idea as well as other impacts. Bridget. Um, Libby, did you say that there's going to be a, a kind of deliberate community involvement around middle the middle school offerings and curriculum? Yeah, that, would well, that be around Crafter's Edge? Around, oh, so, so, the so future of Crafter's Edge. But Crafters, that kind of implicates the specials, right? I mean, that they're integrated. 
Um, I mean, I think that that's great and that it's really good time to take a look at those. Um, and since since you mentioned the middle school and that point about Crafter's Edge, I just wanted to throw out something that I know was kicking around a couple of years ago around foreign language at the middle school when the fifth grade got shifted there, that there was a lot of parental interest in moving proficiency-based foreign language education into lower grades at the middle school since they were there. So I don't know what Katie's thinking about or you're thinking about, but I just wanted to throw that idea out again and remind that there was a lot of, there's certainly a lot of community interest in them um, around using moving the fifth grade to the middle school as an opportunity to um, bring real proficiency-based foreign language education to younger students. And I don't think it's played out, but could it be on the table again? Or something board members could be asking the community about now. Mm -hmm. Libby, in terms of the fine arts position that you were just talking about, possibly expanding there, we did do a survey, well, we, the you and or your team, I don't know who did it. Yeah, Renee did um, it. Uh, a survey last year, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And was, was that at the high school level or was that at the middle school level? At the high school level. Okay. Yeah, and really what we're looking at, so we have, we're having a lot of conversations right now because we have a couple shared positions between Main Street Middle School and the high school. Um, that does get difficult to do uh, because their schedules are different. <laughs> um, so it, it is difficult to share positions between the two. The instrumental people in the inquire make it work pretty well because of the nature of their gigs. Um, but when you're starting to talk about other positions, um, so we've heard loud and clear from the community, for instance, over the past couple of years um, around, and, and many people who are in this board meeting have heard as well, um, around health education. And so that's actually an area when I say we have opportunity right now to increase this capacity um, because of our enrollment, which is health is a required course in ninth grade, um, that and we have the opportunity. So we're looking at can we increase that position to offer more health education across our um, fifth through twelfth graders. Um, so and how do we do that? How do, how do we do that in a way that we do we share a position? Do we not share a position? Do we you know like those are the kind of conversations we're having right now. Um, because that has been made loud and clear to us that that is something the community values and wants. Um, so anyway, th those are the kind of ideas that we're talking about right now. Great. And I just add real quick, uh, again, for those who aren't familiar, I always didn't, I never knew what Crafters Edge meant or who they were or what that was, because it, it's like an inside baseball kind of term. But my understanding is, that they're, it's sort of like an eighth grade capstone where they put on performances, they will bake sales. It's like a way to sort of learn responsibility and organization and also do some fun things like host dances for the younger grades maybe, but someone else feel free to fill that out. But again, I think it's another thing that I just, not all of us knew what Crafters Edge meant, except for that they make pies and have really fun <laughs> and, events. And really cool wood furniture that when I was cleaning out the classrooms this year to get a classroom into our tech room, um, I got to take some home. So Bridget, I, I got Ben's stuff back to Bridget. <laughs> it wasn't that clear. That was great. <laughs> and, uh, there's also a the business sort of aspect to it, that there's money being raised. Um, so there's an ability to like, you know, kind of calculate expenses versus income and how you're going to use it and spend it in different ways. Huh. And we're trying to figure out how to keep things like this is what the community conversation is. And we're in such we're not we're nowhere near. A, but we're trying to think about how do we keep some valuable pieces like what Bridget just said, like financial education, which is I, I personally think it's so important and we don't do it enough. Um, and perhaps turn the focus to community service um, in a different way. So and, and giving back to the community in a way. So we're we're working. We're kind of playing with that idea a little bit, and we have some really good interest with some first from some of our top-notch middle school teachers around this. So it's exciting. Um, but Katie's going to plan that conversation with the community um, starting after the December break. I would just add that um, Crafters Edge is like a really beloved legacy in this town. There's big framed photographs in the hallway at the middle school of all the various 
um, classes that participated in Crafter's Edge dating way back even to my era. <laughs> um, but I would definitely echo that was the point that I was going to bring up was the um, health education. I know in particular at the middle school when kids are first being introduced to sex ed, um, there's been a lot of community organization around um, the quality of that education at the middle school and wanting something different. And I know that um, that Viper has been working on it. <laughs> AKA um, Mike Mary, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> another inside term. Um, I know that he's been working really hard on uh, potentially getting a new, adopting a new curriculum for the middle school, but there was also a lot of discussion about potentially, um, I don't know, shifting around uh, the duties around that particular uh, teaching assignment. So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Um, my main concern is something that Grant brought up at a previous meeting around because potential projections are showing Union Elementary School class sizes um, dropping slightly, that there was some talk about potentially cutting staff, um, faculty positions at UES, and that concerns me. Yeah, it's, it's a little tricky next for next year um, because right now our, our enrollment numbers at kindergarten and first grade may not be accurate for next year for our enrollment number for next for next year's kindergartners and next year's first grade may not be accurate because of the pandemic that we just don't know um but right and right now uh, those classrooms are about 12 kids in a classroom if the numbers hold which is not healthy for kids um you want you want about 17 to 18 in a classroom for real Real, so it's, we're not looking at that right now unless we have to, unless the board tells us to. Um, but they right now, if the numbers hold, they are very low at Union. And what exactly is that? Follow up and ask. Oh, sorry, Jim. Was that is that kids that would do first grade or sorry, I missed it or is that that would be next year's K and and one. Okay, that's what I thought. Thanks. Clarify. Okay. So I, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on the question about enrollment numbers. So it seems like building the the special services program is a big theme in the proposal you just shared with us. How does our facility space look for being able to accommodate that type of a program? We're not yeah. talking about a lot of students, but we'll be talking about students who have special needs that might need breakout rooms or more dedicated space to be able to serve well. Do we have that right now, or as part of the program yeah. you're looking at, maybe having outside, well, district space outside of our current buildings? No, we're not looking at that at all. Um, but you're absolutely right, Ryan. Very astute of you. Um, we That's part of the conversation of if we, develop more programming to keep kids in house, um, then we do, we're gonna need to do something with some space. Uh, UES actually does have space and that's what we're looking at right now. They have a beautiful space actually, <laughs> um, that Andrew the Rose is gonna put on our, his architect hat. And because of our capital, capital projects as well as the, his buildings and grounds budget in general, we think that we can do that pretty um, well without adding a whole lot of money onto the budget. Um, but it's really, I don't know if you've ever been there, right, but it's the um, special education suite at UES. It's kind of, they have like a full office suite that no other building has. Um, and so we're looking at how could we keep some of the offices and make it more of a student friendly space. Okay. And obviously it's all going to depend on students in individual cases, but it was just, yeah. as we grow it, how does it kind of fit into what we have to work with? Well, what you're saying is exactly right. Like we need small spaces for individual kids who have a lot of sensory needs, you know, so do we have those small breakout rooms with carpets on the wall so kids can touch the carpet? You know, like that, those kind of things are the things that we're talking about right now. Um, and how do we build it so it's much more student friendly for our kids who really need that type of environment? in order to be successful. Grant, I saw you turned on your camera, so I know you have something to say. <laughs> no, I just finished the conversation. 
Bridget's got her hand up. Yeah, no, Bridget, sorry. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Emma's point because it's about the sort of community landmines around class sizes and changes in staffing that, um, and I know Ryan's like, he's so great at communication that I don't think it's an issue, but in the past that has caused, I think, caused staffing changes um, and class size changes to be even more of a, of a community concern and a community reaction because there wasn't clear communication about what was happening. So, you know, it's like, a grade went from, you know, five second grades to four or third grades, but no one ever said to people that was happening. And, you know, yeah. people just are sort of piecing together, wait a minute, like, <laughs> there's only, there's only be four classes in the class and, you know, feel like they haven't been told. So again, Brian's been such a great communicator through all of his time in this grid. So I, I know that he would know that, but I think that really helps if that change is going to happen, that people just find out straight up this is what the plan is this is how large you expect the classes to be this is why we're going from four to three or five to four yeah, yeah no, I would... right now unless we have to we're not planning on that right now um unless we have to to do other things but there is a reality that um we'll need guidance from the board around that our our high school population and our middle school population our middle school population is significantly large and our high school population is significantly growing and so there, there is the reality that um, that it's either a give and take or it's just a give, <laughs> um, or, which gets expensive when you're talking about teachers, right? So if you're adding one teacher, that's approximately seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars when you're talking about benefits. So there, I mean, it's not a small chunk of change. So it's just something that in the next year, or probably two or three years, um, that we're going to have to grapple with a little bit. If yeah. the model holds true. Yeah, and I would just echo what Bridget says. Uh, you know, past past attempts at you know resizing classes have been sticky, and I think a lot of the stickiness has been that um, some of the some of the communication around it was was not as as direct and clear and upfront as it could have been. So you know, to the extent that that any of that will occur, like, you know, it, it, it would be good. And I think you and Ryan both do an excellent job of this of just, you know, being very plain about um, the rationale and, and what's happening. Emma? Another issue that's um, both community landmine and I think a, a priority to potentially look into, I've heard a lot about the, the expense of field trips and the way that we fundraise around field trips and field trips that have a long-standing history that we pretty much know are going to be happening every year um but that we're still <laughs> asking individual families to raise money for so i know i've heard a lot of buzz around potentially building some of those field trips into the curriculum budget i think that would be something interesting to look into yeah great we did do you remember the number that you you put or bridget do you remember when we were talking about that the beginning of last year i do remember the beginning of last year was it like 200 it, it wasn't a ton it wasn't like huge I, I think 200 might be too high but i think we did have a number yeah i don't remember i don't remember what it was off the top of my head but we did make a conscious effort last year to make sure that the principals were budgeting what they needed for field trips. The only outliers are those ones that are, you know, like a, a trip to Canada or a trip to Ireland. I mean, those kinds of trips that would really be hard to put into the budget. And you'd also end up with some, some equity concerns if you don't um, fully fund that for all kids who are interested. But as far as local field trips for instruction, we are we have tried to make sure that we've budgeted for the full cost of that so that people aren't having to fundraise and families aren't having to come up with it on their own one of the field trips i'm thinking about is the fifth grade field trip to boston i know that's a very expensive field trip but it's also like you know one of those big capstone moments of middle school that everybody's looking forward to and they've been doing the trip since the beginning of time and I do think, I do consider it an equity issue. It would be the reason why I would want to build it into the budget um, so that that pressure is taken off of families. 
Yeah, and that's one of our new administrators. So I have a meeting with um, with her, uh, I think on Friday, to go over her budget to make sure that she's fully understanding how you know what we how we work, what the process is, and I will bring it up to her to make sure that if that is a field trip that is important from the curriculum standpoint that she wants to support, that we make sure that we have enough money in the budget to to do that. Excellent. Other questions or comments? The one yeah. thing, oh, oh, go ahead, Andrew. I was just about to say, in the past, we've kind of come up with um, a general public outreach plan. Yeah, I was just going to yeah, talk about that and our lack yeah. thereof this year. Um, oh, yeah, it's that, also a different environment, but. Yeah, I mean, is that something we want to do? Because in the past, what we've done is we've kind of split up various groups and, um, you know, there are fears even like hosted events in the basement of the library and kind of got people together and just brainstormed over priorities um, and then reached out to just various, you know, uh, interest groups in, in the city um, and in Roxbury as well. Uh, is that something we want to kind of formally do and try to split up um, or just given the COVID times uh, and also like honestly the this is probably not the year for huge new initiatives um, uh, is that something we want to do formally or do we just want to kind of each individually um, feel out networks we have I, I don't know. Um, I know that I had heard in the past of what the board used to do again under times when you could go to the senior center or you could host yeah. some kind of conversation. I mean, I'm happy to do whatever is useful. I think I think having the board meetings over Zoom like this has definitely opened the door for folks to participate. So maybe maybe that we formally sort of invite the community. We block an hour of certain board meetings and host that conversation as part of that meeting or. We could we could divvy it up somehow. I, I'm not sure what that looks like, but I'm I'm happy to um, host separately or or as a team. And I I think this will be the way that we that we need to do it. Does that excuse me? Does that need to be a board meeting, or can we host independent meetings and not call them board meetings? I mean, like previously, this was something we do outside of the board meeting would have maybe two two members go um, you know set an hour aside at the senior center and just go and listen to, to what their concerns are you know same with like you know the friends of popular schools um you know i think steve used to do some outreach to some of the uh, you know kind of trade and business organizations um uh you know the our budget yeah, doesn't the affect. Too. Yeah, yeah. I I do think it's I I'm I I have no problem with us reaching out to business organizations, but I always thought it was kind of funny because our budget doesn't affect their tax rates, and they don't. Maybe look, talking to them about ways that they could work with students, but I feel like we have professionals who already focus on that. I'm thinking like yeah. Matt McLean and that whole crew. So I always thought that was kind of a little bit of a funny thing. Yeah, I'm I'm totally fine. Um, you know, not not necessarily doing that, uh, or at least not not business groups. But I think it might be good. You know, the parents groups. Um, you know, the, the senior center. Uh, you know, any other groups you can think of. And I, again, I'm not sure, like for instance, with the senior center, I'm not sure whether there's a good platform to really talk to the senior center at the moment. Um, that's something, yeah, someone could reach out to Janet Claire and, and ask her. Um, uh, but I almost, I almost wonder if we could, also just kind of send an email blast to some of these different groups and say hey do you have any budget issues budget concerns issues concerning the school that that pertain to the budget um that you want us to consider in this process 
And another thought is if we had something on the district site to channel focused feedback with a couple of questions saying, hey, you know, what, what, what would you like to see us invest in as we move forward as a, as a school district? Those, that's a, that's a, not the most eloquent way of putting it, but I think you get what I'm, I'm getting at. If I can, one, I, I would say that one of my worries is that we're late to the yes. class, that the, that we're going to present a budget to you on December 3rd or whatever that date is, which is a month away. So I just want to put that out there that, and I'm not saying that as a blame game or anything like that, because this is just a different year and we've had some other things on our plate as a board, but, um, but it, it is a little bit late for kind of some processes to happen. Yeah. Libby, I liked the um, town hall style that you did um, that I helped with right before school opened, you know, something like that, like a zoom town hall and we could even facilitate some breakout rooms based on topics or something like that. That could be a quick, efficient way. And we could talk to Jana and other stakeholders to try to get people to participate just in one big town hall together. Would that, would that I have work? Another, I had one other um, budget priority that came to mind. Um, around the issue of equity at Union Elementary School, I've heard it talked about quite a bit, the SNAP program that we're not doing this year, but that we've done um, in prior years. And there's been a lot of talk about just rolling it into the budget and having it be free to all students. And I don't understand all the complexities of what that would take or how expensive it would be. Um, but just at first blush, it seemed like a good idea. Um, and, and watching what's been happening with COVID and how all meals have been made free to all students, um, it definitely strikes me as something we should consider. I, I was watching Grant's face because he's you're not you're thinking about the snack fairy, aren't you, Grant? <laughs> yeah, we it already is paid for. So, so I was I was just watching Grant's reaction to that. <laughs> so it's already the budget. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Kind of is, kind of isn't. Um, I talked to Jim Birmingham about it because that was that was one of the positions in food service that was kind of covered by the general fund instead of food service. But I think that got restructured, and with this being a, now the COVID world, uh, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, but I have to talk to him because it, it also involves things like you know federal reimbursements, state reimbursements. So you're just talking about the snack program. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually talking about, so I understand, I understand what you're saying, that the position now is paid for in the budget, um, the, the physical person who, who organizes the program. I was more talking about food and making that available and, and free to everyone who wants it or needs it. And snack, I, yeah, I, I need to talk to Jim, though, because I don't even know now whether, you know, snack is even a term. Like, is snack really what we're calling breakfast now? Um, so let me, let me talk to him about it and see, you know, kind of what we have done in the past, what it, what the definitions are, um, and, and what he has to say about it. And hopefully we can bring some kind of proposal forward. Yeah. I know it's a moot point this year because they're not doing, I mean, as, um, Renee commented at the beginning, they're not even doing breakfast as cool right now, but breakfast is separate from snack is separate from lunch. Yeah, so, so in terms of to-dos, um, um, Olivia, assuming you're willing to do the town hall, um, should we just send out some, put it, you know, why don't you give us a date to send out to the board and then we can decide here who can do some outreach. I'm willing to reach out to, to Jana and see, um, yeah, if she can connect connect up with, with folks at the senior center. Um, 
the admin team usually goes and has uh, lunch at the senior center a couple times a year. We're not going to be able to do that this year. And all of us were saying the other day how much we're going to miss that. Yes. <laughs> they ask the best questions about our budget. <laughs> Grant really likes going. I don't know if it's appropriate, but I, I do have a professional Zoom account that I pay for that I'm happy to host parents. I'm happy to host teachers. Like if there's groups that you want, just need a board member to be a sounding board, I'm happy to do something like that if it's in the evening. Yeah. I think if we lived in a town hall, we could invite a bunch of groups and see how many people come. Or if you want to do a, you know, Joe, if you want to just do a separate reach out and then bring ideas to the board meeting, you know, that would, would work as well. Um, I mean, the groups I'd love to go, I agree with the senior center, if we could get someone to reach out to the three school groups, UES, MSMS, and the high school. Um, and then, yeah, if we set a sound hall, we can just make sure it gets posted on the, you know, various social media sites where we'll get probably a lot of parents and community members. But I think if we do, we do outreach to those four groups and if anybody has any other group they can think of um that would be great too but um does anybody want to do the the school groups i can do jana but that's i think i'm also happy i like andrew's idea of doing some kind of either it's a you know a comment form on the web page or a really simple yeah. survey monkey kind of survey or something out that we could put out on the web page or put out to parents that's another way that Folks could kind of quickly weigh in. I'm happy to help Anna or whomever yeah. draft that. If that's great, I can I can reach out to MSMS and UES um, parent groups. Okay, awesome. Does anybody want to do the high school? And I'm thinking reaching out with an invitation to a pre-scheduled. Town hall. Yeah, I think we just, yeah, Libby can look at her calendar and maybe propose a date and just send it to the board. And then, you know, we can just send a quick email uh, saying, you know, Libby's going to do this. We'd love to, you yeah, know, great time to have you come and, um, you yeah, know, talk about your budget priorities. Yeah, and the board will be there in listen mode, or at least some members will. Um, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure out a way to find. I can figure out the high school. Yeah. I'll just out to all the groups. <laughs> okay. I and all of them. Okay. Yeah, awesome. I, I almost, yeah, I was going to say, I almost just wonder if it makes sense if, if Emma's already reaching out to, um, those parent groups if she just isn't it consolidated now? Adrian's here. She should be. Yes, Adrian knows all about this. <laughs> Not yeah. a problem. Anna can help with that. Anna's got, Anna and the parent groups are like this. <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's just a communication to them yeah. once we once we set up a time. And if, if Anna can assist, that, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. at a, just because of board meetings and negotiation meeting, probably November 16th is about the only day that would work. Yep, that I think that that works. Um, so you guys can put put that on your calendar. It's just with the negotiations, with three negotiations and board meetings. The nights are pretty um, few and far between right now. Yes. Um, and we have and, the, the, the let's, holiday. Yeah, I don't think we have to make it too late either, because um, uh, I know that. Um, as much as you love spending time with us, I'm sure you also like to see your family every now and then too. So you saw her earlier; she was dancing behind me. That I can exactly. see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, kind of make it at a yeah a, a time that's convenient. So. Um, all right. Uh, anything else? Any other questions for Grant or Libby on the the budget? Thank you both. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, no, the, the budget conversation this year is not as as uh, scary as we were thinking it, it might might have been. Um, we're about to have an executive session to um, 
uh, talk about both negotiations and board candidates, but I see that Josh Kerlink has joined us. Um, and I just want to give him a, an opportunity to introduce himself before we head into executive session. Um, so Josh, thanks for joining us and um, you go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, Murphy's Law struck again. And as we're getting everything set up, we had a, a quick run. So I'm back now. I'm pleased to just be able to kind of listen in and see everyone's faces and hopeful that, you know, if, if not now, at one point I can join the board and, and help shape the, uh, the school district that our kids are in. So, but I'll, any questions I'll happily answer. Great. Any questions for Josh? Well, that's yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of say what we said to the, the other candidates who spoke a little earlier. We have a, a really amazing slate. Um, Good. Good. Uh, so, so thank you for stepping up. Hugely appreciated. Uh, but we are going to have three openings in March. Um, so if, if we don't appoint you tonight, definitely, you know, keep it in mind and, and uh, uh, we'd love to see you run. Um, and yeah, and you know, obviously we are, um, this is, this is unusual to have four candidates for a vacancy. Uh, it's good. That's so, good for you. Yeah, no, it, it's great. Um, it, it's a good thing to have. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll be, we'll be making, um, a decision after, uh, we come out of executive session and, um, um, yeah, and we'll let you know. And, and if, if you're not chosen, uh, you know, please, please do keep the board in mind because we, uh, we will have openings and, and, uh, opportunities to serve. So, so thank you very much. Um, thank you. with that, I need, I need to go to executive, um, session for negotiations, um, and then to consider board candidates, which, um, I'm not sure exactly personnel, um, but for the purpose of negotiations, we need the first, um, uh, and Bridget, are you going to join us in ES for the negotiations part or no? This is going to give you the opportunity to one last time. I'm happy to do that. Yes. <laughs> you want me to make the motion, right? Yeah, Bridget. Bridget, after this, after you make this motion, no one will ever know how to make this motion again. Yeah, I was going to say. All right. I move that the board find that discussing uh, contract negotiations in open session would put the board at a substantial disadvantage. Can somebody write that down? I second that. <laughs> um. Ryan. I. Jill. I. Mara. I. Annika. I. Andrew. I. Emma. I. And Bridget. I. And then now Jim, I need to hand. Jim, I'm also here now. This is Oh, Jerry. sorry. Hey, Jerry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I. <laughs> um, and now we need a motion to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of discussion negotiations and um, board uh, discussion board appointment. Um, do you have a motion for that? I'll make a motion the board enter executive session to discuss contract negotiations and personnel matter. I second that. Uh, Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mara? Aye. Anika? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Emma? Aye. And Bridget? Aye, with the oh, and Jerry. I'm going to recuse after the negotiation part. OK, great. Aye. And Aye. Jerry? Aye. OK. Um, Libby, you want to do the magic? Got it. Do I have a motion to appoint, and ironically, she is the last one standing, Mia Moore to fill the seat of Bridget Casey um, uh, on the board? So move. Make a motion to 
Um, Anna can just okay. do it. I get it. Um, Jerry? Aye. Anna? Aye. Mara? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Bill? Aye. Emma? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Uh, congratulations, Mia. Um, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> she probably yeah, does, because she's been at every one of our meetings for the past. Yeah, she does. Um, what you do have to do is um, you can either call John Odom or um, you know put a mask and go to City Hall and get sworn in. Um, and then is you can City us. Hall open right now, Jim? Are it's they open by appointment? Okay. And it's, it's open like Tuesday through Thursday, I think it's set hours and then by appointment. Just um, a heads up, the phone thing takes 30 seconds and then you don't have to figure out whether City Hall is operational right now. Yes, um, and get sworn in and then you're good to go. So, uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Libby and Anna can work with you on uh, getting an email, so. Yeah, we can make that happen. And the board will wanna think about which one of you wants to be a mentor to Mia. Yes, and committees. <laughs> um, right, uh, committee. Do we yeah, have a motion? A motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. So move. move to adjourn. Oh. I second. Uh, Jerry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Mara. Aye. Andrew, Jill, Emma, Ryan. <laughs> Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Bye.